Boom! What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Very excited to be talking about financial inclusion. We have Andre Zamowski joining us on the show. Hello. Hey, everyone. Glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Super excited to have you, brother. Very excited that John Uke joined, introduced us, which is very kind of him. And now we're going to be talking about financial inclusion, blockchain, cryptocurrency. Very excited for this. Andre is the founder and CEO of Ambisafe, which makes financial markets universally accessible by tokenizing equity of pre-IPO companies, as well as helping early stage companies launch their token offerings. Andre launched the first merchant service for Bitcoin in 2013 called BitMerch and the first multi-currency wallet called Holy Transaction in 2014. He also holds the first university degree in cryptocurrency, and you can find the links below to orderbook.io, ambisafe.com, holytransaction.com, and the SpaceX offering for their pre-IPO um, is coming up on June 10th. There's a minimum $100 investment for that, and also the Twitter for Andre. We'll be unpacking all of that more as we go. Let's jump into things with one of our favorite questions. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Um, sure, I, I think the world is going into the direction of accelerating. I think the world is an educational simulator. So I'm, uh, I, I'm a believer in simulation theory. So I think it's an educational game. And uh, we are here to learn something, although we forgot what. Uh, and what I see is happening is that the game speed is accelerating. Things are happening faster and faster. Uh, and all technology, all like e e economy trends, they, they all just accelerate which accelerates the process of learning on the personal scale and on a community and global scale. Oh, that's good stuff. Okay, so we're here to learn, but we forgot what exactly we came exactly. to learn. Yeah. And it's a learning simulator. Right. Okay, and then this pace of economic growth and change that's happening is making learning faster. Right. Okay, and then one of the things is to be able to help people learn faster, which is kind of part of this financial inclusion that you uh, Yeah, general trend of movement of the economy into the digital form and digitization of everything uh, is is accelerating it whatever you you make digital it, it becomes faster so once economy is moved when economy is moving to the digital form things start to go faster uh, like uh, it used to take for a company for a company between five and ten years to go from uh, nowhere to an IPO phase uh, and with the ICO, uh, it became possible in, in a year or less to go from nowhere to a public offering uh, stage. Uh, so both companies and investors who participated in that learned their lessons faster. If the company was supposed to fail, uh, it has failed faster. Uh, if it was supposed to succeed, it succeeded faster. Like Ethereum have succeeded to some extent. Uh, a lot of ICOs have failed and currently they're worth nothing. Uh, so it's been taking 10 years before it became digital. Oh yeah, okay, so the, the permutations that we run of different startups and ideas can now, with ICOs, you can know about their success or failure potentially faster in a year or two versus uh, the five or 10 years. Yeah, well, whenever the processes are happening in digital form instead of paper or uh -huh. physical. Yeah. yeah, so it's not exactly the ICO what makes it faster, it's movement of, uh, of the business model into the digital form. The f so it's the fact that I can now, with my own voting power, I can say, I like your idea digitally. Here's my digital liking right. of your idea versus yeah. having to handle it in the physical world. Right. Okay, interesting. I like that this view is very good. Okay, we're, we'll end up coming back to this at the very end again, <laughs> and I'm looking forward to it. Um, both as a consensus technology, decentralized consensus technology, but also just simulation theory in general. This would be very good. Okay, now let's jump into your journey. So you're born in Ukraine, and you started programming when you're nine years old. That's right. What hooked you into programming? Yeah, so parents were bringing me into their offices, and they were letting me play some computer games um, and I I started asking more and more complicated questions like how to put this game on how to switch to the next level in this game and then what happens if I edit this character in the source code of the game so eventually they were not be, they were not able to answer the questions so instead they they bought me some book about low-level programming in assembler language when I was 
seven or eight. And I, I read it and actually understood some of it. And I started writing programs on, on paper based on that book for university students when I was eight. Uh, so yeah, this is how I got in, into programming. It, so this is a reoccurring theme is that sometimes the ones that are get hooked into programming when they're young, uh, they want to make changes in the video games that they're right. playing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just trying to hack video games and ended up uh, writing a lot of software. And then what were you doing in your teenage years with programming? Uh, lots of things. Uh, I've started launching websites when I was 12. Uh, so initially, I, I started with writing uh, viruses for my classmates <laughs> and <laughs> distributing them with games just to practice my virus ri writing skills. It was fun. Uh, and uh, then once I got connected to the internet, I immediately got engaged in, into IRC wars. There were wars between IRC channels happening where people were trying to take over uh, the channels using some automated war bots. Uh, so I was wow. writing IRC... Uh, bots that that were aimed to like take over certain IRC channels so I was IRC uh, meaning uh, internet relay chat internet uh, relay chat this is where people used to hang out in the internet before online chat rooms and okay. social networks came yes, came yes, into yes, yes. Okay. Uh, existence uh, yeah so I met a lot of real hackers there learned some hacking uh, skills learned a lot of so it, it's basically a dark net like uh, mm -hmm. all the darknet communication is happening in, in the IRC. So I got into that first and only then I got into normal web. Uh, yeah, and then I started launching websites with collections of these scripts for IRC. Uh, then I got into more conventional gaming like StarCraft. Uh, so yes. I've launched, uh, I, I wrote a tournament system for Ukrainian StarCraft community. Uh, just because I thought it would be nice to have uh, and when I was 14 and then the owner of the of that community website offered me uh, a job uh, and he didn't know that I'm 14 uh, <laughs> maybe he did, I, I don't <laughs> remember uh, yeah so I started launching more and more websites I've released my well, once the number of websites I've launched uh, exceeded 10 I realized that I need a content management system, so I've mm -hmm. developed a website content management system like like a WordPress, but mm -hmm. another one. Mm -hmm. And started launching websites based on that. It became an open source project. Mm -hmm. Some people started contributing. Uh, so I've launched an open source project when I was 14. I didn't know that it's cool back then. Uh, and mm, yeah, then I started doing some stuff for money. Uh, and a lot of it is under NDA, so we can switch to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was interesting hearing you talk about the scripts in the internet relay chats, and then to try and take them over, things like that. Also the um, uh, the, the 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 latter work with website development, and then building. You ended up actually open sourcing the the content management for the <coughs> websites, which is yeah. actually very cool to build something and then open source it by yeah. 14. Yeah. Yeah, that's good stuff. Okay, then um, the interest in blockchain technology came up. Yeah. So it's a long story, but we have time. <laughs> uh, I, I started watching conspiracy movies when I was 16, I think. A lot of them were talking about um, uh, some shadow government behind the Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. some behind the scenes government, how world is ruled by bankers, that this is all wrong and should be changed. But none of those movies were offering a solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went to a couple of local meetups uh, of anarchists in Ukraine to see what what other people with the same interests are doing. And they weren't really doing anything cool. Uh, they were discussing moving to eco villages as a solution basically to disconnecting uh, from the capitalist system by going offline like hiding in the woods it didn't seem like a solution on a large scale to me so i had this idea that uh, i came up to this idea that if i 
if I can raise money from lots of these people who want to change the world but don't, but don't know how, and hire a couple of students and let them, and let them play with an ideas of alternative economies, uh, eventually they will come up maybe to some working solution that, that can scale. So I've published, I've written and published this proposal in 2008 uh, about launching an open source experimental project of alternative financial system. Mm -hmm. And I've published it uh, at one of the Russian anarchist forums. It was called Zeitgeist Movement. Uh, it, it was due to the name of one of the movies. And I was in Ukraine. I was located in Ukraine, but I've published it at Russian forum. Uh, in the project proposals section, full of other anarchist proposals. <laughs> uh, and four hours later, the, the post got removed uh, for no obvious reason to me. Uh, and I wrote to moderators like, what the fuck, what was wrong with the post? It was a legit proposal. Nobody responded to me. And the next day, I got a phone call from somebody with unidentified number um, and they were like hey mr zamovsky i have a serious um, letter to you listen carefully uh, if you don't stop all work with computer your family will get uh, health issues you will be taken care of by special forces of russian federation uh, goodbye uh, this is how i got in the blockchain uh, so th this is where i realized that i found something um, uh, something, some, some really valuable idea because I got a, a call from Russian intelligence agency asking me to not work on this idea. Um, and for the, for, the, <laughs> yeah. for the next two weeks, I, I was like, I was really afraid. Uh, I thought that I'm an, under continuous surveillance uh, by Russian intelligence while in Ukraine. And I was afraid to touch my phone, to touch my computer because I thought I'm under surveillance and they asked me to not. Um, and I, I quit my job because they told me to not touch computer anymore. So I just called to my uh, then employer and said that I can't work with computer anymore with no explanation. And I just sat at home and was thinking about some alternative offline business ideas like opening a coffee shop or something like that. But they all seemed pretty boring. Mm, so I've, I found a compromise with myself. Uh, I have decided to take a job of like project manager so I don't write code by myself. So in case I will be tortured in the basements of KGB, I will have an excuse that I didn't write code by myself. Uh, and uh, yeah, so for the next year, uh, I, I worked at marketing agency as a manager without doing anything uh, really interesting. And a year later, uh, I thought, like, fuck, no, I, I really want to work on this idea. Um, and um, we, we, we have a question from the, the viewers. The, the pentagram is a part of the first language that's stuck with AI DeepMind programming, or at least a star with the circle. Why are few coders spiritual when so much leads to the existential? I'm not sure. I yeah, that's. The I know it's hard. It's a hard question. Um, I, th yeah, I think we we'll, we might we might have to um, to to ask for a little bit more clarification. Yeah, we'll we'll scrap it. Well, yeah, we might have to ask for a little more clarification. Maybe that it had something to do with um, coding uh, and spirituality. Yeah, we can get yeah. into simulation theory questions at the end. Yeah, to not interrupt the story. Yes, uh, yes, sure. Sorry. Sure. sure, you're good. No worries. Uh, Yes, yeah, so a year later I've decided to, to resume the project. I, I've decided to do it by myself, write it anonymously and publish anonymously and see if it takes off. And I googled just in case somebody has done something similar during this year and discovered that some Japanese guy called Satoshi Nakamoto has released a very similar project and it's called Bitcoin and even had a forum with 100 users. Uh, so I, I decided to research it uh, deep, uh, deeper and I went to that forum and investigated source code of Bitcoin mm -hmm. and this is the right time to pull up the screenshot. Okay, awesome. Let's get that up. So then, okay. So then this was you in that forum. Yeah, so this is me in 2010 uh, after I just discovered Bitcoin asking how it works. Uh, 
And I didn't like the idea that nodes were connecting via IRC network because I've participated in that IRC channel wars. I knew how easy it is to shut down a channel or IRC network. And if I'm not wrong, up until 2012, uh, Bitcoin decentralization was relying on existence of a centralized IRC network. It was really easy to shut down the entire Bitcoin network by shutting down uh, a couple of IRC servers, which I didn't like. Also, I didn't like the idea of mining. So mm -hmm. I asked uh, Questions the authors about of Bitcoin to, to clarify, is it, do I get it right? And after Satoshi responded that, yes, you got it right. Why is a transaction fee needed? Uh, decentralized node list, uh, protected from potential situations when a node is hacked. So you're asking questions. Yeah, as of today, yeah. Today they look like a very basic questions, but it was 2010. This is nine years ago. Yeah, yeah only like one or two persons in the world which are, who were Satoshi and Gavin Anderson un understood how Bitcoin worked, worked by then. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, and then you ended up getting an answer here. And your an yeah, this was interesting. From Satoshi. Yeah, so this is actually, yeah, Satoshi. And the answer was four days later. Yeah, so after figuring out that Bitcoin is still relying, that, that Bitcoin is relying on the IRC network and that mining is there, is there, I didn't really like the idea of mining and I think it can be argued that it, it doesn't scale well uh, if you analyze um, the structure of mining pools today. It's really centralized. I've decided to continue working on my own cryptocurrency. And for the next two years, I've been doing it as a side project, four hours per week while traveling uh, to different festivals. I didn't really take it too seriously. It was just a fun uh, idea to work on. Up until 2012, I think no Bitcoin exchanges existed. I don't remember precise date when Mt. Gox uh, went live, but Bitcoin costed less than a penny and up until 2000, 13, it wasn't clear at all how much it will cost. It, it costed like less than penny per Bitcoin. Uh, so I didn't buy much. Uh, and I kept working on my own cryptocurrency, believing that Bitcoin will fail uh, because of the centralization issues and mining and some other things. Okay, so there's a couple things here. First is you in 2008 had already published your own idea of how to decentralize. 2009. The, 2009. Mm -hmm. Your own idea of how to decentralize the global banking infrastructure. And then you had that crazy call from the intelligence agency. That's nuts. That's crazy. And then you ended up kind of, you know, having to take your hands off for a little bit. Um, but then you found again in 2010 this happening. And you, when you, when you saw this happening, you saw uh, an aspect of centralization with mining. So with the, the way that uh, the, 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 the next blocks are created, you wanted a way that potentially wasn't uh, a centralized uh, amount of compute power that could maybe be the most optimal, uh, or be the highest efficiency at making that next uh, block. I just saw that people who got into mining really early, according to how it is designed, uh, they get like in proportion, in proportionally higher returns and, and power in the system compared to the ones who got late. Like later. You, so you it's, it's, a, it's a power law. So like with anything, the earliest ones that get the most amount of traction early yeah. usually stay at the top. Yeah, and to me it looked like way too in proportion. I, uh, like I, I wanted to be much more even distribution of, of initial uh, yeah. currency in the system. And this is the questions that you were asking, the things you were thinking about at the early days. Yeah. Okay. And then, okay, then in 2012 you had your own current cryptocurrency that you were also working on. Uh, uh, yeah, so I kept working on my own cryptocurrency for the next two years uh, while Bitcoin was like in like be below the one cent uh, in, in price. And when my currency was finished by like, at, was like 70% finished, maybe 50, uh, Bitcoin started to take off. And because I needed um, cryptocurrency to, to be able to, uh, to launch my other businesses in first place. So it, cryptocurrency wasn't the goal itself. I actually decided to, to work on, to reinvent financial system to be able to 
um, to operate businesses in the internet uh, without uh, dependency on the local government approvals or local financial system. Uh, it's close to impossible to, uh, to operate a business in Ukraine, especially small business where I was based. And I've discovered that I'm unable to accept credit cards uh, from like more than five countries. Uh, I have to pay taxes that didn't make sense. I mean, it's easier to not launch a business with the taxes that they impose on you in Ukraine. Wow. Um, and yeah, so I've decided to try to invent an alternative financial system that would uh, let me operate a business. Um, with freedom. With, with more freedom yeah. for well, like globally, regardless yeah. of yeah. where I am. And it was the main uh, motivation. And because Bitcoin solved uh, that issue, because Bitcoin started to take off and we finally got a currency uh, that works globally, no matter where you are with any internet connected device, I've decided to start testing my business idea on Bitcoin uh, instead of completing my own currency. So I've, uh, I've put it on hold for a little bit. Uh, I ended up uh, passing it as a thesis project in university uh, instead of launching it just to, to have it saved somewhere. And uh, I, I don't think Ukrainian university where I uh, like presented it, understood what I was talking about. I, I think they still don't know, uh, but in their ar archives, they have like one of the first cryptocurrencies that, that were developed. Um, and I, I got the diploma with uh, cryptocurrency uh, as a thesis project. <laughs> and then I've started launching businesses for, uh, for Bitcoin. Uh, and I've launched the first merchant service, so my initial... Let's, let's yeah. talk r right before that. Um, very cool how the first university degree in cryptocurrency, that's so interesting. And hopefully many more um, in blockchain cryptocurrency, testing thesis projects, very cool stuff. Then you left Ukraine for San Francisco prior to making um, the, the merch and um, holy mm -hmm. transactions. So teach us about what in 2013 got you wanting to come out to San Francisco. Yeah, so initially I was invited here for a short business trip, uh, but I took a walk around the mission and discovered that I really like this place. There are a lot of hippies, electronic music, uh, psychedelic culture, and uh, all these tech companies and they are all... <laughs> uh, yeah, so I just sat on the grass in the Dolores Park and in less than a minute some guy offered me to buy mushrooms and acid without like even, even having to look for it. it. Seemed like a really nice customer service. Um, so I really loved this place. And yeah, I didn't think too much uh, more before moving here. More business opportunities, more open-mindedness. Right. Okay, okay. And yeah, Ron. How was the acid? <laughs> I, I didn't end up buying it. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, because Ron's looking for some connections. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so then that ended up getting you into this first merchant service for Bitcoin in 2013 called BitMerch. Mm -hmm. Okay, so teach us about that. So my goal is to make sure that blockchain technology gets adopted worldwide. And I had a lot of hypotheses about what's, what's missing for that adoption. Yeah. My first hypothesis was that an ability to easily accept Bitcoin for websites was missing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've developed uh, a PayPal-like service that allowed any website by embedding a piece of HTML code uh, to start accepting Bitcoin in less than 10 minutes. Uh, and it's got some uh, some demand, uh, but it wasn't significant enough. Uh, I, I soon I, I quickly discovered that the bigger problem is lack of cryptocurrency in the wallets. And it may sound funny and obvious today, but uh, again, back in 2013, it wasn't obvious at all uh, what's what's missing. So the next thing that I've built uh, is an integrated exchange that allowed people to buy bitcoins first. Uh, using their credit card and then pay uh, to those websites who embedded uh, the accept Bitcoin button. So it was kind of reverse of what a lot of merchant services are doing today uh, for Bitcoin. Uh, and then I discovered that wallets are missing. And uh, yeah, so I moved to San Francisco in 2013, got accepted to a startup accelerator here. And we've graduated with uh, a multi-currency wallet that had integrated exchange to mm -hmm. switch easily between Dogecoin and Litecoin and Bitcoin uh, and some integrated APIs for merchants and, and so on. 
But it wasn't enough again. In, in 2014, uh, all cryptocurrency startups uh, saw the same picture. The growth of the users uh, has been exponential until then, and then it kind of got more flat and linear. And I think what has happened there is Bitcoin has reached uh, the market, the size of the market of people who can understand it without additional education, mm -hmm. to whom the problem of centralized currencies like uh, Federal Reserves, uh, corrupt bankers and so on, uh, it seemed like a big problem, people who cared about it. Uh, by 2014, uh, most of them have found Bitcoin. The rest of the people, they didn't see any value. They required education. Uh, they wanted to see like lower transaction fees or 20% discounts on, on goods. They, uh, they didn't see, see the reason to like, learn how Bitcoin works, to deal with all the software uh, complexities really easy, and so Really easy onboarding. Yeah, so it became really clear to me in 2014 uh, that the main problem with... So before 2014, my assumption was that if we give people tools, they will unleash themselves. And they will quickly pick up this instrument and uh, the world will transform. And after that, I realized that it's not the lack of tools what is the main problem, it's education. Most of the people don't even uh, know that, that the problem exists, that bankers are corrupt and so on, they don't understand, so they are not looking for tools. And this is why Bitcoin started to, to grow much slower after 2014, uh, once that early adopter um, population was uh, on board. And, uh, yeah. That's a great way of explaining it, that there's always a time period where the market becomes saturated with the people that are wanting to, to solve the problem and understand it, and then there's a certain amount of education that's required for those that are late, late, later on the adapt, adaption curve. And so that's a, that's a, that's a great point, because then how do you get them engaged and involved if there's already a, uh, there's some friction with needing education about what the technology is, there's lack of user experience that's really easy to get engaged with it. So it's good that, you know, catching on to that. So then that was both BitMerch and Holy Transaction. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So then, um, then you know, for the last four and a half years now, it's been founder and CEO of Ambisafe. <coughs> and you're teaching me about how this is really about the, the financial inclusion, the financial markets become, making them become universally accessible. So it's everything from the early stage companies with launching their token offerings all the way to the pre-IPO companies. Yes, yeah, so I've experienced the problem of financial inclusion personally several times. Uh, first time when I was launching websites or trying to launch business out of Ukraine uh, based on credit cards infrastructure that didn't really work uh, if you are based anywhere outside of the developed countries. Uh, and the second time when I tried to raise money for my uh, cryptocurrency project from Ukrainian investors in 2011. Uh, I, got, uh, I got like second place in the software architects competition, but I got 10th out of 10 places in the project ideas competition uh, for, uh, for my cryptocurrency project. There wasn't a single investor I talked to who didn't say that it's crazy and it's not gonna work. Like, uh, there were not, there were no investors in Ukraine who could understand what I was talking about in 2011. But there were in San Francisco, maybe just a few. Uh, so a company with a very similar business model that I was proposing called Ripple uh, have been trying to raise money at the same at the same time, but they were based in San Francisco, not in Ukraine. So they've raised 500k for their little cryptocurrency project. And now they're one of the biggest and most successful cryptocurrency companies. So the, dif the difference is location. Uh, so they were located in one of the economic centers of the world. I was located in like the middle of nowhere. And um, yeah, so fast forward, uh, I've started MBSafe after uh, seeing uh, that Bitcoin is not going too far because of the lack of education. But a lot of entrepreneurs have tried to, have been trying to launch all sorts of experimental coins and tokens. Some of them were backed by gold, some of them were backed by some other experimental economic models. So it was pretty obvious that there will be 
a lot of cryptocurrencies and some of them will eventually succeed but i didn't know which one so i didn't want to commit to any uh, of uh, cryptocurrencies specifically and because of the wallet company that I've, that i've launched before we were getting a lot of requests to white label our wallet software so i've started mb safe uh, with the idea that most of the companies who would benefit from blockchain technology are actually not blockchain companies. They don't have to understand how the technology works. So I've started a company that uh, allowed companies to launch their tokens easily uh, to experiment with their business ideas. And we were launching some experimental stuff for the first two years, uh, 2015, 2016. One of, the, of those experimental projects survived and succeeded. It's Tether. Uh, we licensed our wallet software to Tether. Uh, and then at the end of 2016, uh, the wave of ICOs kicked in. It was the next killer app after the currency. And we happened to be the only company on the market uh, that had uh, the solution uh, the solution that everyone was looking for the software to launch an ICO the software to launch an ICO yeah yeah, yeah. so this is the the success cases that you've had with organizations so so what how would how would someone interested in launching their ICO use the Ambisafe software uh, we uh, allow you we allow companies to get ready to launch their ICO in two weeks or less instead of uh, like six, uh, instead of four to six months that they would otherwise spend on preparing all the tech. Of course, now because of the competition, all these times like went down and there yes. are a lot of similar offerings on the market. Uh, but up until 2017, it's been taking companies years to develop wallets for their new cryptocurrencies. and we automated this process we allowed you uh, allowed companies to launch new cryptocurrency in in less than a month so and coming back to financial inclusion uh what why ico became a killer app it made it like irrelevant of where you are located uh, no matter where you are if if you have a good idea and you can present it to an, to an online community uh, you can raise money uh, for your idea, so if the concept of yeah. yeah, so if the concept of ICO existed uh, in 2011, I could have raised money for my cryptocurrency project while still in Ukraine, uh, but back then I had to travel to San Francisco to uh, to get some funding. Whereas now, even in the most uh, m markets in the world where it's just two dollars a day or so in what people are being paid, that with a very powerful idea and connection to the internet, one can potentially raise money from right. areas of the world that make hundreds of dollars a right. day. And so then that can really kick start things off. Yeah, that's very powerful. So then this is a, uh, Ambisafe is, is providing kind of a, a, a bedrock for people to be able to build their ICOs through and right. on top of. And then does, does Ambisafe just take a percentage of the funds raised? Is that how you guys get paid? Uh, Something we like that? make most of the money on software licensing. We've, we've tried a lot of things, including taking percentage. There are a lot of nuances there. Yeah. Uh, I prefer to not dive. Gotcha. Into, yeah. Okay, okay, cool. All right, and then, all right, and then let's go, um, let's go into, so that's, so that's both on the, um, the, er, the very uh, early stage companies launching their token offerings, that part. Then there's the, um, the tokenizing equity of pre-IPO companies. So it's both from the very small level of around, around the world starting their ICOs, but it's also on the massive companies that are pre-IPO, such as SpaceX that you're working on right now. And this is crazy because this is a, like a $50 million investment that you're purchasing the, the shares through US Capital Global Partners. And then, that, um, and then for someone to get involved, in this, they only need a hundred dollar minimum investment. Yeah, so this is the next uh, stage of development of them of the market. In 2017, most of the uh, people in this space realized that most of the tokens are actually securities, and they have to be handled as a securities and sold as a securities yes. and so on. Uh, but once you switch from utility token model to security token model. 
it becomes much more difficult to sell because there are much fewer things to speculate about. Uh, while with utility tokens, you can easily promise uh, that the next day they will be used at space stations and coffee machines and uh, I don't know, every uh, piece of infrastructure in the world. With securities, you can't say anything like that. It's, it's much more clear what securities are. They are financial instruments representing equity or some debt obligation in, in the company. And investors know how they work. Investors know growth patterns. They understand that a security will not be worth like 30 times more the next day just because it is on the blockchain. The company actually has to deliver some results, has to execute on their idea. So even though there are a lot of buzz and events still going on around uh, security tokens, if you take a little bit closer look, there aren't actually any like public sales of security tokens that were successful. Most of them were funded privately during roadshow in somewhat traditional way of financing. So most of the security token offerings are failing because um, they are just not really different from any startup raising money on with paper based equity. Uh, so uh, because we made a lot of bets on the security token market, including launching uh, order book, the trading platform for security tokens, uh, I I had to think like how to make this market take off. Mm -hmm. uh, so what was missing apparently is a high quality, high demand, uh, high quality, high demand. Uh, security tokens. Uh, so it, it had to be offering uh, by a company that is already successful. Uh, but uh, Uber and Airbnb and others, it's, it's, a, it's an additional risk for them. They are not really uh, interested in offering their, uh, their equity via token offering just because they can. Uh, so I, br yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I went to my investment banking friends and we sat and brainstormed for a little, and we found a way to tokenize equity of, uh, of successful pre-IPO companies legally without having to, to, to get their participation. Uh, so we'll just buy it on the secondary market Correct, yeah, and right. put in the fund yes, and yes. offer the equity of the fund. Yes. So it's, it's a form of derivative. Uh, it's not a direct equity as if it was issued by Uber directly yes, on the blockchain. Correct. Uh, it's like a one uh, step away in, in the legal structure, yes. uh, but the economic value is similar. And we have, um, yeah, this was interesting too, you know, on the website on, um, you know, spacex.orderbook.io, you, you, uh, you, you mentioned the legal disclaimer, the offering's not available to the residents of the following countries. So why is it not available to US, Australia, Brazil, you can't, Canada, Switzerland, United Kingdom. Yes, yeah, so if you are an investor in one of these countries, it is much easier for you to buy, uh, to buy this equity on the secondary market uh, if you really want. We are focusing on financial inclusion. We are focusing on the develop, developing countries where people make several hundred bucks per month. And uh, this is why. Uh, we are trying to solve the problem for six billion people instead of several like million who who have other ways to invest oh so those oh so the countries that are listed there uh, already have the ability to they're wealthy enough to purchase uh, directly uh, potentially uh, right i mean there are still a lot of opportunities there uh, but the cost of launching this offering there is much higher like legal all the preparations oh. like filing for regulation oh, and so on okay. while most of the developing countries like uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, and others, uh, they haven't even issued a regulation about the legal status of security tokens. Yeah, it yeah. will take for them a couple of years, maybe. years to understand what is it. Uh, so it's, so it's they can come in and, and buy without yeah, having to go through the red tape. Yeah, it's kind of a gray area, but we are not scammers, we are not doing anything bad. So I think it's, yes, uh, yes. it's a win win. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So June 10th. Um, this is going to be available, so in about a month, um, available for um, countries around the world that were, um, that were not listed there, that they can then have a $100 minimum investment um, into having a token that, rep that is a representative part of the, 
uh, shares of SpaceX. Yes. Yeah, so one of the interesting things we've done here uh, is the token represents a share in the company. Uh, while in most offerings, um, in most offerings, token is some contractual promise or obligation of a company. And the way we incorporated this fund uh, is the token is an actual share. The bylaws of, of the fund says that uh, the this class of shares, USPX, is represented by tokens based on Ethereum. So by buying a token, you are buying sh a share in the fund, and the fund holds equity of the SpaceX. Yeah. 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 And the, the minimal price we are going to sell it is 100 bucks. Uh, as I if you try to, to do similar thing today manually, like if you try to get uh, into SpaceX or Uber or other companies before the IPO, uh, it would probably cost you between $25,000 and $1 million. So we are significantly dropping the minimal, yeah. the, the entry barrier and making it available to broader population. Yes, yes. On uh, another conversation that <coughs> we have later, it'll be good to dive deeper into the technicalities of how a company that or an idea from around the world wants to have go through Ambisafe's platform because I think it'd be interesting for people to learn about how they can start to get their own uh, token offering out, have people help fund their company from around the world, how that works on a technical level. Um, and then same thing with this as well, we can get deeper into the technical nuance of how exactly um, a hundred dollar investment goes uh, through the order book here and how I have this digital ownership where I store it, all this type of stuff, how I can then go and get it back out. Yeah, it's a really complex combination of like legal and technical structure. It's it's all explained on the website. I, I, I awesome. Yeah. Okay, it's all explained on Ambisafe and on or, on the order book here. Yeah. Okay. 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 Cool. Cool. Um, and then, and then the hopefully you can get to a point where you're starting to do this um, pre-IPO um, ownership uh, tokenization actually for a lot of the companies that are that look like they're becoming trillion dollar companies that way you can take the money that's being concentrated in the one percent and give people the ability to come in and that's the financial inclusion yeah so the, this is the plan we are going to so currently only uh sand hill road funds and like uh, sf by area vc funds they are about the only ones who uh, who get access to this unicorns and uh, by launching this platform uh, this combination of uh, of legal and technical setup uh, we're making these opportunities available to the rest of the people worldwide uh, so yes we are planning to tokenize more unicorns uh, yeah i prefer to not disclose the names in advance uh, but this is our plan to um, to breathe in some life in the security tokens market. And once it becomes mature enough, uh, earlier stage companies can also participate. I love that motto, tokenizing unicorns. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good one. And also financial inclusion. That's what that's, that really is um, such a pressing thing as we see more and more wealth being concentrated in, like you said, why is it that only some of the Silicon Valley venture capital funds are the ones able to do the um, the the Series C rounds of hundreds of millions of dollars um, in these companies? When to be able to democratize that uh, is a very beautiful way to include financially. Let's hit um, um, let's hit how you, so the United States is half of all ICOs right now. Yeah, which, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's like the general pattern of the market share. Whenever you launch any online business, you usually get 50% of sales in the US and the rest, the other 50 is distributed worldwide. Okay. Yeah, so the US economy is as big as the rest of the world's economies combined. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> as the rest of the world's combined. Yeah. Oh man. So that means 50% US and then 50%. Yeah, China is a little bit tricky because they're like they is isolated. I'm, I'm not sure how it plays in this picture, but if you analyze <coughs> sales revenue for like most of the um, like global online businesses, you will see that 50% is sold in the US and 
the other 50 is uh, the, rest. the rest yeah, yeah. so it could be something like 50 us 30 china and then the breakdown is like three percent four percent blah blah less yeah okay and then um within th then that would be another interesting question is kind of how do you see it evolving with cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology how do you see it evolving geopolitically uh, i think blockchain is um, a kind of a policeman for governments whenever some government is trying to do something weird whenever economic crisis like hyperinflation happens like it has happened several times in argentina in venezuela in turkey other countries whenever it happens the local population no longer uh, goes to to banks and i mean whenever it happens government restricts the population's ability to to exit their uh, fiat currency their national currency to yeah. buy dollars uh, whenever the crisis happens you are usually unable to exchange your national currency to dollars uh, to protect yourself from inflation uh, and bitcoin provides a solution for that problem now whenever the crisis is uh, whenever the crisis happens uh, people no longer rush to buy dollars people rush to buy bitcoins whenever some government fucks up people exit from national currency to bitcoin yes. so you can see that bitcoin price spikes every time there is a crisis anywhere in the world uh, so now it's like a policeman for any government if, if government does something wrong with the economy people will have an alternative people will have this cryptocurrency market that they can access from any internet connected device. What an interesting analogy is the policemen of the world that are making sure that the corruption um, doesn't get too far. Doesn't get too far, yeah, yeah. And that we transition away from centralization over time. Where else, um, the decentralized consensus technology is a fascinating thing. We want an, a, a future where we all have, where can all be educated enough, uh, have enough time to become educated enough to make some sort of a say in the direction of civilization. Where else do you see the consensus technology heading? Uh, sure, very good question. Uh, anywhere, as long as there is a business process where at least a single piece of paper involved, there is a potential for disruption by blockchain. What's really disruptive about the blockchain is that it moves business processes or any kind of processes that require standardization into the digital form and standardizes it. Consensus is, is a form of a standard, how you uh, circulate agreement between the parties and it's done in digital form. So what blockchain actually does is it removes the paperwork. It converts the paperwork into the standardized digital transactions with digital identity. And once it happens, it accelerates this process by the factor of like 100x or more. It makes it 1000x cheaper, more transparent and so on. So blockchain is moving all transactions from paper to digital form, any kind of transactions, any kind of paperwork, any like boring bureaucratic work that people hate today uh, will be uh, moved to some blockchain based platform eventually. Like uh, getting an approvals from various uh, government agencies to, to sell the house, for example, you have to visit five different offices, get an appraisal, like, get some signatures from the bank and from the city and, and so on. Once it is on the blockchain, like one of the companies I'm advising Proppy is moving it to the digital form. It can be done entirely online in less than an hour instead of having to spend weeks on like walking to the offices. So the smart contract is created between you and I for you to move a f an asset in the physical world to my ownership and then the funds are transferred to you digitally and this is all made on a decentralized yeah. ledger that's immutable that this happened. Yeah, it doesn't have to, to involve the transfer of funds at all. It's a matter of representing uh, all the participants in digital form. As long as everyone has a digital identity, yes. like a pair of keys, private and public, you can interact online instead of having to print, scan paper, or like go meet and so on. Yes, yes. Okay. And then even to the degree where it's s something as 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 you know these unique identifiers is an is an interesting thing. Who assigns these unique identifiers? Are is my unique identifier public? Uh, it's up to you to decide. I mean, uh, 
how do you find the software me? is really flexible uh, we can really implement any like business requirements if it makes sense to make it public we'll make it public uh, if you don't want uh, for example with kyc uh, we want to know for, for security token transfers we want to know which address has went through kyc which public key has went through kyc kyc yeah kyc process K uh, know your customer know your customer yes yeah, so we don't want to transfer securities uh, to any unaccredited or non-kyc uh, person so uh, we store uh, the record of like who went through kyc in the public form like we mark addresses as kyc publicly but we don't upload any of the private data like the actual first and last name email addresses and so on they all kept privately in uh, in the kyc providers databases so whatever is required uh, yeah, usually it's the information that is generally available in um, government registries like dmv violations or like property titles database or stuff like that uh, if, if it's public there we'll, we'll make it public on the blockchain so the software is extremely uh, uh, agile the, yeah. so it can be so it's really cool how the how it can the applications these um, uh, are, are very endless there's things in biometrics that are very interesting there's things in identity that are interesting then transfer of goods um, in the physical world and the digital world with smart contracts okay and I hope that we can make some sort of a geopolitical consensus as well with way that we want to move. So still find, still incentivize innovation, but at the same time have more cohesion with the environment and with each other so we're not, we're alleviating suffering faster. Yeah, I think blockchain will also uh, bring people into more agreements on a global scale uh, because w once you move all participants to online or digital forms, it, it becomes much easier for them to communicate with each other. It, it removes friction yes. and communication goes faster. Yes. So the faster communication is, the faster people will agree on any issue. Yeah. And then what would you say is a skill that every child should know going into the exponential technology age? A scale? A skill. A skill. Yeah, uh, yeah understanding of... Um, public key cryptography is, is a must like w what is digital signature how how wow. to verify digital signature uh, it's yeah I think it's a, it's a must have nowadays to be able to to verify that the piece of information that you've just received from somebody is coming from from that person instead of someone else Wow uh, so knowing cryptography knowing that you sent me this and that it's not some obscure entity that's trying to sh ha pretend that it's you yeah knowing that would uh, for example allow you to to see which of the messengers like facebook and whatsapp who claim to be protected and private are actually private mm. and you will be surprised and can you <laughs> teach us about what you found about that uh yeah most of them are not really uh, are not encrypted uh they are encrypted but the company, uh, the service provider can change keys uh, on the on the fly without notifying you. So it, they add no value as long as you are not in control of, of the keys. You're not in control of the keys. Yeah. yeah. Of the encryption keys. Interesting. Yeah, there's a lot still to unpack about encryption. Okay, let's ask you the couple questions that we ask on the way out of the episode. Okay, the first question is, are we alone in the cosmos? Uh, it doesn't seem like that. If you do basic, I, just look for UFO videos on YouTube. You will find a lot, like thousands of hours of various UFO videos. Thinking logically, even if 90% of them are fake, even if there is some conspiracy of uh, video editors and Photoshoppers all around the world who are uploading them randomly from random locations every day nonstop, uh, and 90% of those videos are fake because there is this conspiracy of Photoshoppers worldwide, uh, there is still 10% remains. Even if it's 1%, it's, it's enough to prove that we are not alone, right? And then how about we venture into the simulation theory? Uh, simulation theory. Are we in a simulation? I think we are. Um, 
okay it's it's a it's a switch so let me uh, download the context okay so my take on this is that the phenomenon of quantum physics are much easier to explain uh, with simulation theory than with other very complex theories uh, that uh, physics researchers are coming up with, like string theory, you are not even able to understand it. So uh, the basic idea of this, like how to understand quantum physics is um, a computer optimization. If you're familiar with computer games or any kind of computer-based environment, like you can try walking Google Maps with your phone in front of you, uh, it doesn't render the places until you get there in, in this simulated environment. When you switch, uh, when you just finished some, some level in a computer game, it takes a couple of minutes to load the next level. It's not rendered, it's not loaded until you are there. To not waste computation, uh, to not waste computer resources on something that nobody uh, is, is watching. Mm -hmm. Quantum effects seem to be really similar. Uh, the universe doesn't render things that nobody is looking at. It's much simpler explanation that we actually can simulate and understand with our modern technology than all this like string and multiverse theories. So this is one of the arguments. Another one is um, most of the religions uh, actually tell you if you if you remove all the um, all the bullshit that they accumulated with thousands of, of years, most of the religions they tell you that. Uh, we, we have kind of some immortal soul or spirit outside of this world and we came to this world uh, to learn something mm -hmm. and it's a temporary world we are here temporarily and uh, once we are out we'll uh, uh, we'll reflect on on what we did and, and mm -hmm. so on so it, it's kind of a common theme that is going uh, through all religions that this world is not as real as, as it appears and it is confirmed by psychedelic experiences uh, most of the people who have tried DMT they, they also report that uh, they they meet outside of this world with some more advanced creatures that and they see their past lives and, uh, and they meet their dead relatives so um, people uh, the, the main problem that I see here is that um, every religion every spiritual uh, or psychedelic researcher is using their own t terminology there is a lack of common terminology uh, to, to describe this thing uh, everyone is kind of talking different language uh, there are thousands of different languages to describe the same thing but if you actually create a data model like a software architect if, if you map uh, objects uh, that people are describing in, in uh, using software tools the structure looks 90% identical in every description whether you talk to some shaman in Mexico or um, or some I don't know psychedelic researcher in San Francisco uh, they describe very similar uh, structure uh, like uh, we have we have some body or soul outside and it's plugged into this mm. environment mm -hmm. to learn some lessons mm -hmm. and there are many iterations to learn mm -hmm. uh, it, it takes many uh, many iterations of the game mm -hmm. to, to learn the lessons mm -hmm. and this is what people describe as uh, reincarnation I'm fucked <laughs> 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 yeah, there's so many things there. One of the things is the uh, saving compute on render. That's uh, a frequent one that we hear. I like that one a lot um, and seems to make lots of sense. Also that um, there's so many reasons to simulate. There's so many things to learn um, uh, about what actually happens to civilizations as they evolve, all this type of stuff. And then of course the role playing characters that we play in this game in that we're, what are we learning? We're learning lessons. How many times does it take for us to learn the lesson with what degree percentage success did you learn that lesson? Mm -hmm. Maybe when you only learn 70%, you have to replay the level, replay the, the, the 80 year life that you're here, maybe. These are all very interesting um, questions. The past life lineage, well, how a shaman and psychedelic adventure interplay with all of this. 
it's yeah, it's good stuff. We can spend a whole nother um, session talking about just this. That'll be that'll be a good one. Yeah, we're on. I just want to give a big shout out to Hopi and G, who's been watching the whole show. He thinks you're a really cool guy, and uh, thanks for watching, Hopi. Yeah, Hopi's actually been commenting quite a bit over the last couple of months. So a huge shout out to Hopi. Thank you, thank you. We've uh, heart, we've liked and um, and uh, replied to a lot of their comments. Um, did you just assume their gender? How could you, Ron? Did I? What did yeah. I say? Hit so I, I wanted to add one. <laughs> yeah, Are we yeah, still we streaming? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we one, have one more question, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. One, one really important difference between how most of the proponents of simulation theory understand it and between, and between me, how I understand it. Most of the uh, people who like, evangelize simulation theory, they believe that we exist only in the form of software. So if the computer is switched off, we disappear. While religious experiences and psychedelic experiences tell us that we actually have bodies outside that are temporarily plugged into the computer, it's an equivalent of putting the VR headset on your head. Yes. Uh, so uh, this is the main difference. Yes, okay, so this difference is also important because one of them is like, oh, just unplug it from the switch, and the other one is that, no, you've actually spiritually decided that you're going to go into this right. experience and that there is no plugging or unplugging. This is a process that you go through to learn yeah. um, type thing. Yeah, okay. And that whatever the solar spirit or the decision power is pre-birth and whatever it is after death is something else that we'll have to yeah. Yeah, unpack. Um, Andre, this has been so interesting. Last question is, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? The most beautiful thing in the world? Uh, hmm. Let me think about it. Yeah, take your time. There are so many beautiful things in the world. Uh, hmm. Okay, I think it's the universe itself, if, if you can imagine it on a large scale. Mm -hmm. The more you understand it, the more details you can imagine, the, uh, the more awe and like, yeah. beauty you, you see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> Audrey, this has been such a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for teaching us about all mm -hmm. that you're working on. It's very important work, mm -hmm. getting yeah. us to financial inclusion. Good job. Thank you. Keep up the great work. And we have to do a whole nother session on simulation theory together. That'll be really fun. Um, okay, huge thank you everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on financial inclusion, on what we're talking about with cryptocurrency and blockchain. Um, do check out the links below to orderbook.io, ambasafe.com, holytransaction.com, the spacex.orderbook.io. That goes on June 10th, minimum $100 investment. Check that out. On the, also Andre's Twitter, check all that out. Huge shout out to Ron Vogus for producing and directing much love we love you very much and share content like this with other people your friends your family your co-workers online on social media get talking more about financial inclusion let's do it everyone let's get there together and go and build the future everyone support simulation so we can continue building this project as well artists entrepreneurs organizations around the world that you believe in support them manifest your dreams into the world thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you soon peace